Hello, and welcome to this episode of HBCU. I'm your host, D. Brown, CEO. Joining me on the program today is Marla Dickerson. Marla is affiliated with multiple HBCUs, but she received her undergraduate degree from North Carolina A&T. Marla, welcome to the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, it's, it's, the pleasure is all mine. So I want to start, and uh, I love when I have uh, someone on the show that have a, a lot of institutions on their resume, give me a lot to talk about, but I want to start by just understanding how did you select North Carolina A&T? It was, I can tell you, completely by happenstance. So growing up in Louisiana um, and in a household that um, really wanted, my mother wanted us to really be in tune with who we are and love ourselves and love everything about our blackness, our womanhood, because I have two sisters. Um, we live in a country, so love everything about the country. And I didn't really think at the time that I needed to go to an HBCU. I um, had a, a great foundation, an unbelievable foundation at home. I had selected another school to attend um, because I wanted to make my own major. Um, and so in the mail, and that kind of dates me because this was pre-internet. Um, in the mail was this pamphlet that came and it had a picture of George Washington Carver on it. And so it was the USDA 1890 scholarship. And so I was like, what do these people want me to do? I'm not going to do anything with a peanut. He's done everything that he could <laughs> possibly do with a peanut. Um, I'm not going to do anything. Well, I grew up in the middle of sugar cane fields. I didn't want to be a farmer, had no aspirations of being a farmer. Um, but I had heard about North Carolina A&T because uh, my aunt lives in North Carolina. And so after having a conversation, bringing the, uh, the pamphlet into the house, having a conversation with my mother, who literally had all her friends call me to tell me how dynamic a degree in agriculture would be, I applied and you had to apply to um, one of the 19 HBCU land grant institutions. And because we traveled a lot when I was a kid, I loved travel. I loved experiencing new things. I knew I wanted to go off. So I applied to North Carolina a &T to make my mama and my aunt happy. Um, and then I received a call. The scholarship was awesome also. Let me just tout the, the scholarship because the scholarship is still in existence. Um, so at the time they paid for your tuition, room and board. Um, you received a computer and a printer. And they also um, gave you an internship with the USDA during the summer in your uh, discipline. And so it was really something that, you, that that couldn't be passed up. So I applied and um, I got a call from Dr. Alton Thompson, who at the time was the chair of the agribusiness department. And he asked me, was I ready to come to Greensboro? And um, listening to him and his energy, I knew at that particular point in time, that's where I needed to be. So do you remember your freshman year? What, what was your experience like there, uh, your freshman year? So um, <laughs> it was very, very interesting. It was fun. Um, it was my first foray into living in a dorm. We didn't have air conditioning, um, but my roommate luckily had, who was from, who was from Philadelphia, um, they brought an air conditioner down. Um, so we had air sometimes in our room and it worked. Um, the... I'm an early, early bird, early riser. I've always been that way. So I was okay with eight o'clock classes. Um, it was electric to just be in class with people who look like you, who are really energetic about not only their education, but about life. Um, to see the Greek letter organizations on campus. Um, it was... It was probably one of the, the best times of my life. And as I always look back on it and I'm like, if I would have known what I was experiencing, I probably would have relished it a little bit more. I probably would have, you know, um, I may have been a five year, you know, five or six year uh, <laughs> student at uh, North Carolina a &T. Um, But it was it was just electric. Um, now I'll tell you, I, when I came, of course, Louisiana and North Carolina are far apart. Um, I didn't have my car the first, um, the first year on campus. So the familiar nature of just being, um, on campus and the campus was small at the time. Now it's the largest 
uh, HBCU uh, in the country, right. but um, we had probably about five or 6,000 students. So you pretty much knew faces, but you know, as you move through. So when we would walk down the food line, because I also have always drank bottled water, um, even when people were drinking bottled water. So I would have like these bottles of water to carry and we would have students who we knew from class who would pass us in cars and like, well, do you do you need a ride? You want us to, to take you back to campus? And of course, I'm from the South and I was like, I don't know you. I've seen you, but I don't know you. So I'm not getting in your car. <laughs> but um, but it was it was just that type of, you know, feeling, you know, the professors and who invited us over who were far away from home, you know, to, to have, you know, dinner for holidays or just to have, if they saw you doing something wrong, um, you know, just to have somebody who was there, who, you know, who had your back, um, and your best interest in heart. So, um, I, I can't, if I had it to do all over again, and this is always what I tell people, I would make the same exact choice. I would not do anything different. Who, who are some of the uh, professors that, uh, you know, help mentor you or take care of you or help you through your journey there? Definitely Dr. Alton Thompson, um, Dr. Donald McDowell, uh, Dr. E. Jamaker, um, John Paul Owens. He actually, uh, John Paul had, uh, he had served in the Peace Corps. And so for a while, I, I was thinking that that would be uh, something that I wanted to do for a year after I graduated. Um, we had, I had another economics professor who, um, because agriculture economics, of course, we took classes in the business school as well. Um, he was, he was very in, in, instrumental in, um, he, along with Dr. Thompson and Dr. McDowell, um, really helped me to see that I wanted to pursue something in economics. So, um, it was, it was really those in, 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 in Carver Hall which I have a love for is where agriculture economics uh, department was located. So literally everyone um, in Carver Hall, Ms. Iris, who was the administrative assistant to um, Dr. Thompson, um, Ms. Marilyn Brewington, who was the administrative assistant um, to Dr. McDowell. It was just very, very um, friendly and open. And uh, those are, those are some of the people who, you know, I still cherish to this yeah. day. So what were homecomings like at uh, North Carolina A&T? A <laughs> <laughs> uh, they don't call it the greatest homecoming on earth for, uh, you know, just because it's there. <laughs> it's not just, uh, just the name. But it was, it, was, it, it was electric. And I can tell you that because, again, growing up in the South, I had been to HBCU games because I went to Southern's games all the time. I went to Bayou Classic, um, you know, going into it as an actual college student is something different because you're experiencing the concerts, the alums who are coming back, um, just the camaraderie of everything. I'm not going to go into like all the stories, but it is, it is definitely an experience when you are on and I'm not going to, you know, say that Southern's homecoming was any greater, any less than uh, ANT, but to be on campus and to walk around and this and to go to RVs where people are cooking food and you know blasting music right. and doing line dances and you know um, just sharing life and in good times, it is it is something that I think everyone needs to experience at least once um, in life. So um, I loved homecoming. I went to my first homecoming. Um, in the gym, in Corbett Gym, um, homecoming concert in Corbett Gym when I was at ENT. So, uh, and it was Cameron. Uh, so again, that dates me. So Cameron <laughs> was popular back then. So, uh, so that was uh, my first concert ever. So, how do you feel uh, that ENT uh, prepared you for your professional journey? So I. Um, I'm a staunch believer because of my mother of uh, speaking um, life into people, um, being positive, um, really making sure that you understand your attributes, but also understand your weaknesses, um, understanding that you have a support system. And so being, again, so far away from home, being the baby of three girls, um, it was something that everything that I, I was taught at home about respectability, um, the importance of education, 
um, financial literacy, um, that the world is open to me, um, that I'm enough, that um, I'm intelligent, that it's okay for me to speak my mind, um, that it's okay to, um, you know, make people uncomfortable and, um, you know, make people comfortable with uncomfortable situations. And so those things that I learned at home were mirrored, mirrored directly at North Carolina a &T. You now, know, so the confidence boost of being at home was something that was carried over. The The challenge of learning more was something that was carried over at North Carolina a &T. The um, ability to have somebody to tell you that you're wrong and you know that they love you and it's coming from a good place was carried over at North Carolina a &T. So accepting who you are, accepting who I am, um, accepting, understanding that um, you, you, you have to be amenable to criticism you, in order to grow um, and really building that support system. You know, those are things that, you know, I carry forth with me here at Southern University Law Center because what those professors were to me, it's important for me to be that type of person for the students who I service every day here in, uh, here at Southern University Law, uh, Law Center. So those are um, some of the things and just, you know, critical thinking. I can go critical reading, uh, critical thinking skills, problem solving, analysis, all those things that actually matter, yeah. you know, when, um, you know, you're trying to get things done. But the um, interpersonal skills are something that I also carry with me. So... After, after graduating from a and uh, kind of take me on your professional journey um, upon leaving college, undergrad. So again, th those um, professors really um, spoke into me um, and helped me to kind of craft my journey. Um, so after that, I loved agricultural economics so much and I loved being Aggie um, that I decided to go to Texas A&M in College Station which was a vastly different environment. Um, and so I received my bachelor's in, uh, I mean, my master's in uh, agricultural economics from Texas A&M. Um, I came home and worked for a while because my grandmother passed away while I was at Texas A&M. Um, and that was the, uh, well, it wasn't the first death I had experienced. It was the first uh, closeness because my mama was a single parent and my grandmother was like my other parents. So I needed to come home. So I came home, worked for Louisiana Department of Ag and Forestry for about a year. And I always thought that the my law career, career was going to be part of my second or third career um, because of the type of work I wanted to do. And so um, I just, at one particular point in time, said, you know, I'm, I'm ready to go for this this legal profession, whatever that's going to look like, because I also had dreams of being in higher education. So I applied to Southern and LSU, um, received admittance for both of them. Southern gave me a merit scholarship. So I was able to, to come to Southern Law School um, on a, a full academic scholarship. And so after I graduated from law school, I opened up my own law firm, um, practiced family law and successions uh, with a five-year plan. Really didn't realize that higher ed was going to present itself as an opportunity to me at that particular point in time. Um, I had a friend who still works here at Southern University Law Center. She is uh, a director in the library. And she called and she said that um, the academic support office was hiring an academic counselor. And she asked if, you know, I wanted to apply. So I applied, interviewed that was in October of 2012. I started in December of 2012. Um, and I've been at Southern University Law Center since then. I don't practice um, anymore simply because of the time constraints. So this is uh, my full-time love, my full-time passion and my full-time endeavor. Um, and so since that time, I've gone from academic counselor to director of continuing legal education and managing fellow of our cannabis compliance law and policy institute. Um, and most recently, uh, oh, and then I went to associate vice chancellor of innovation and strategic partnerships and initiatives. And most recently, as of March 1st, I became vice chancellor of innovation and strategic partnerships and initiatives. 
So I'm going to circle back just to ask you a question about your time at uh, Texas A&M. Uh, talk to me about the, mm -hmm. di the differences in the experiences between A&T and A&M. So it, College Station is much like the environment that I grew up in. Um, it is a environment of predominantly white conservative white individuals. Um, and so I can tell you again, the, the feeling of self-esteem, my self-worth came from my mama because she always spoke affirmations. So it really maybe was not as much of an issue for me as it was for others. But what I can tell you is that walking into a building every day and walking into on a hall, um, my first my first time walking into Blocker um, at Texas A&M on the fourth floor, everyone thought I was a custodian. Uh, so they didn't realize I was a student in their program. Um, there were, I think, I was the only black student in our agricultural economics program. There were three African students in the agribusiness program. So many of my classes, I was either one of three or the only um, black person in the class. Um, there was a black professor who's still there, um, Dr. Fred Bodu, who was my sounding board. Um, he is from Ghana. And so um, I look back on it, everything builds strength and character um, to me. And so did I have like a horrible time? No. Were the parties just as wild? They were probably wilder because with a certain amount of privilege comes a certain amount of freedom. Um, and so they were probably a little wilder. I still had good friends and good times. Um, the only difference was if I'm in class, um, I had one professor. It was easy to know my name. If you're only the only black person in the class, <laughs> people know your name easily. So, you know, I had um, professors who would call on me because, um, you know, they knew my name. It's hard not to know Marla when she walks in the room. You know, she's 5'11 and a half, six foot on other days. Uh, and she's the only black person in the class. So, um, and then there were other professors who, you know, would call me and tell me that I was absolutely wrong in everything that I said. Um, and then my uh, cohort would answer the same question, answer the question the same way, and it would be the best thing since sliced bread. So, um, understanding and experiencing um, that difference, of course, isn't something that I hadn't experienced it before, but um, understanding that this is something that occurs every day in America. And at that particular point in time, it was 2000, I started in 2002. I graduated in, no, I started in 2001 and graduated in 2003. So, you know, we're talking about 20 years ago. Um, and so while I was also there, the president at the time was Dr. Robert Gates, who introduced the 2020 plan to try to make Texas A&M reflective of the state of Texas. So I think that they've been doing a good job with um, trying to increase diversity. But uh, my experience at A&T helped to, to have helped to continuously build my self-esteem um, and the acknowledgement that I'm enough in order to make it through environments. Um, like Texas A&M. Yeah. And again, I think it's a, it's a wonderful school. It's a great environment. I mean, a, a great school, you get a wonderful education. Um, it's just a different environment. And I think the, the goals for everyone who goes to maybe a PWI um, is just to realize that you're, it's okay for you to take up space. Um, you don't need to shrink a cower in order to make other people feel comfortable. You know, I always tell people every day I showed up, as Marla, the same at Texas a and as I showed up in North Carolina. So talk to me about your current role uh, as Chancellor uh, of Innovation and Strategic... Oh, I wish, no, no, not, not Chancellor, Vice Chancellor. Vice Chancellor, <laughs> sorry. Vice Chancellor <laughs> of Innovation and Strategic Partnership, correct? Yes, yes, okay. yes, yes. So um, Ch Chancellor John Pierre is the wonderful head of our institution, and um, I thank him immensely every day for uh, 
giving me this role because it allows me to combine several things, several of my passions. Um, so of course, with the um, murders of George Floyd and Breonna Taylor, and the election of Vice President, uh, well, President Biden and Vice President Harris, we saw, of course, a rush of um, an influx, I should say, of people who were interested in really being uh, intentional and impactful in the DEI space. And so Chancellor Pierre created the Office of Innovation and Strategic Partnerships and Initiatives to help kind of be an outward facing office um, to help curate experiences for these organizations and corporations and law firms who may have not entered into the space and, and didn't know how, how to quite navigate it. And so that was the initial um, objective and goal of this department. Still am the managing um, fellow for cannabis compliance. I still do continuing legal education. Um, and Chancellor Pierre, um, again, is a wonderful visionary. So he, he oftentimes, because of various things, we have institutes. So we have various institutes that are under my office um, that come up with different programming. Um, oftentimes that coincide with continuing legal education and also developing partnerships to help expand the footprint of the law center and then also expand the knowledge of the outside world to Southern University because I always say I put my products up against anyone, my products being my students, but um, also explore uh, expanding the knowledge base of our students. So uh, my office does a lot. Um, we have, and I can list off some things that we do, um, but in addition to partnerships, we have our expungement initiative where we have been fortunate enough to get um, funding from Louisiana Workforce Commission to help pay for expungement fees for justice impacted individuals, um, which I am extremely proud of because it allows me to practice law, um, but also have an impact in communities. Um, expungement fees in Louisiana are the highest in the country at $550 per arrest. We also um, have an Airship Institute where we want to help alleviate and educate um, communities of color, Black people, um, and other communities of color about the importance of creating a will and also moving forward after death with the succession in order to try to maintain ownership of property. Um, and so I'm very proud of that work that we're able to go out and, and do in the community. We um, also have an esports um, institute, it's the Mixed Reality and Virtual Innovation and Game in the Esports Institute, um, which I am. Proud to say that I had not really thought about playing the game since I played Duck Hunt on the original Nintendo a while ago, but I understand the importance of uh, educating and uh, people about this industry, especially young uh, Black people and other folks who are people of color about how to enter into this industry um, and actually develop careers. Um, and I can go on and on, but I'll stop because I can literally talk the next 30 or 40 minutes about what I do. But I'll stop and let you ask a question because well, I know that you probably have some questions along yeah. with cannabis. Well, yeah, so t uh, we have about a minute and a half left in the program. So why don't you tell me about right. your, your cannabis uh, program? So um, cannabis, I'll tell you the reason why I love cannabis is because I believe that it is a way to get black people back interested in agriculture. And so the Lord is not making any more land. And that is a tool in order to generate wealth in communities. And so if we can get back to the land, start to own land, start to understand the value of land, grow our own food, whether that's in the form of animals or vegetables, then it leads to healthy living. Um, the food that you intake into your body and also the exercise that you have, um, it leads to you being able to have some type of asset to, to leverage um, if you need to gain some quick capital. Um, and so I believe that agriculture is the, is the it, cannabis is the tool to get people back to can, uh, to get people back to agriculture. So um, I'll leave you with that because I know it's like a minute. And so, but I, um, so that's why I love cannabis.
because it gets people back to agriculture. Got you. So I want I, as we uh, wrap the show up, I want to do two things. I want to thank you for taking time out your busy schedule to be on the program and talk about your HBCU experience and share your success uh, with the world. And secondly, I want to present you with our HBCU Lifetime Achievement Award for your continued oh, wow. commitment to historically black colleges and universities and for all the great work you've done in your professional and personal life to showcase the success that come out of our HBCUs around the country. And to my viewers, I want to thank you for watching this episode of HBCU. I'm your host, D. Brown, CEO. And remember, without you, there's no me. <laughs>